Well, uh, my name is Liz Wall. I'm a journalist and uh, a speaker. And um, I heard this gentleman over here uh, kind of being skepti skeptical about media literacy, and I'm going to fight back against that. He's not in here to hear me rebuttal him, but I, I am an advoc advocate of that, um, especially considering what's going on in US politics. Uh, but if you don't know a little bit about me, um, my subject is going to be on disinformation in the digital age. Um, this has been a great festival, bringing together great minds in tech and digital and um, all things uh, digital and tech and things to look forward to in the future. My presentation has, is a little bit depressing because it focuses on the, on the downside of tech when it comes to news, tech, and politics and when this has, and what happens when this intersects. Um, you'll see that uh, with this digital age and this digital revolution in the news that it's kind of led to a, um, a co-opting of the digital platforms and um, them being abused by bad actors, by foreign adversaries. And we're gonna get a little bit uh, into that. Um, for those that don't know, I kind of had a viral moment when I quit on air on live television. <laughs> this was back in 2014, and uh, just to kind of refresh your memory, this is the infamous viral moment that will kind of haunt me forever on the internet, so might as well just play it. It's the other one. It's the other one. of sending troops to the... technical difficulties. What's that? Is there the, the other one where I quit? Is there not that one? All right, well, you guys don't need to see it because it's all over the internet. and you, It's like we don't even need to see it. Anyways, I quit on the air. Became this, this viral story. Oh, there it is. Now I don't even want to see it because it's like brings back bad memories, but let's roll it. Oh, it doesn't play. Even better. Anyways, this, <laughs> this is the day <laughs> that I quit live on the air. Um, I was working for a television station called RT and um, had been working there for a couple of years. And when they had approached me, they said that this was a mainstream or this was uh, a media outlet that covers stories that the mainstream media ignores, gives voice to the voiceless, those that feel disenfranchised, and you could kind of cover different stories that are not covered in the mainstream media. And for a couple of years, I found that this was indeed the mission there. But um, in 2014, in my experience, I saw that, uh, uh, that the station became a lot more propagandized, that uh, disinformation um, became pervasive and kind of a journalistic, it became part of the dirt journalistic DNA of this news organization. And um, around this time it was, or at this time specifically in 2014 was the conflict in Ukraine, um, four years ago, over four years ago, and, and that conflict is still Still going on, unfortunately. 10,000 people have died, over 1.5 million people displaced. This was around the time uh, during the Maidan revolutions, uh, hundreds of thousands of people taken to the streets, eventually protesting the pro-Russian president. He was eventually ousted in a revolution where over 100 people died. And um, during this time, RT was very instrumental in trying to kind of uh, d distort the story in a pro-Russian narrative. So to give you a little bit of context as to how this story was portrayed in 2014, we do have that video, a little bit of a mashup of what Russia wanted you to understand about the conflict in Ukraine. What will it take to peacefully settle the crisis? Well Ukraine is torn apart by revolution. As Western politicians cheered on Ukraine's Maidan, radical nationalist groups claimed power across the country. In Crimea, 
Ethnic Russians are now asking for Moscow's protection. Where is Ukraine's legitimate government? What will it take to restore peace and unity? And what are the chances outside forces will have to step in? Crimea is on the defensive. Many in this autonomous republic in southern Ukraine, populated mostly by ethnic Russians, fear what happened in Kiev could bury their quiet way of life. But if you want peace, prepare for war. This is the Crimea. There are two roads connecting the peninsula to the mainland, here and here. This is one of them. Two roads that locals say could become two gateways for undesirable forces from the north. And this is why they are here. They fear that Ukrainian fascists pose a major threat. The country's ultra-nationalist right sector group helped topple President Yanukovych. Okay, so a little bit of a, of a mashup there. Some of the disinformation is, is subtle, some of it is not so subtle, but you could kind of see the narrative there portraying Ukrainians as fascist, neo-Nazis, uh, neo that this was not an organic uprising, that it was fomented by the West. Um, and so basically it was demonizing Ukrainians and portraying Russia as if they were kind of the humanitarian peacekeepers coming to the rescue. Um, up until this time, we didn't really cover a, a bloody conflict in real time, but to see a story distorted in that way, um, as you know, in the fog of in the fog of war and the, the fog of a, den a deadly conflict, um, that was kind of a red line for me. So um, I saw 2014 as kind of a turning point, and it certainly did not end there. Um, a few months later was the MH17 crash. Uh, that is when an airliner, uh, 200 people, were flying in it and they were hit by a Buk missile and 200 people had died. And all the overwhel overwhelming evidence pointed to the fact that it was a Russian Buk missile fired by a pro-Russian separatist but there was a flurry of disinformation spread all over the internet, not only by Russian news sources like RT and Sputnik, but um, as we'll see, the Russian disinformation machine is not just uh, very obvious news sources, but also a combination of trolls and uh, bots and just a multifaceted effort to make it so truth is non-existent or make it so you're unable to determine what truth is. So um, I think the big takeaway is that Russian media really tries to undermine the notion of truth, the notion of fact. And so um, throughout all this, we're kind of watching this in the United States thinking, okay, this is happening over in Ukraine. Russian disinformation, this will never affect us. We are a strong democratic country with strong institutions. There is no way that Russian disinformation would affect us in the United States. And um, things are different today. I don't know if you follow the news in the US, but um, if you do, I apologize on the behalf of being an American. But um, so yeah. Russian disinformation, it's now in the forefront of our news headlines. We, um, after the election of President Donald Trump, our intelligence agencies unanimously con concluded, all 17 US intelligence agencies concluded that Russia had intervened through cyber espionage, through hacking, and through disinformation to meddle in our elections and um, with the intent to elect President Trump, not making this up, uh, this is unanimous 17 US intelligence agencies, with the intent to elect Donald Trump and to denigrate the candidacy of Hillary Clinton. So it was kind of a strategic thing. So there, it was kind of a two-pronged method. It was the, the hacking and stealing of information strategically releasing that through uh, an organization called WikiLeaks, which we now know to be associated with the Russian government. And then there's all that disinformation. 
that I had discussed and kind of with my background and I was watching the the campaigns in the US and knowing Russian messaging and knowing the types of messages that they amplify on the internet they amplify you know extremists people on the far left on the far right conspiracy theories all of this now is mainstream in US politics so it's been really remarkable to see the rise of of uh, Russian disinformation and how it's become a national security and the a national security issue in the United States. So um, from this report, just gonna read this here, uh, a little snippet from it. Uh, Moscow's from the, the, this is shortly after the election. They conclude uh, that Russia's influence campaign followed a Russian messaging strategy that blends covert intelligence operations, such as cyber activity, with overt efforts by Russian government agencies state-funded media, third-party intermediaries, and paid so social media users or trolls. <laughs> and I actually testified in US Congress about this, uh, about this, this whole phenom phenomenon about trolling, and it just seemed so silly and such a nuisance. This was back in 2015, and here it is in an intelligent uh, report, um, just showcasing how social media has become so integral to, um, it's changed the game in politics and things like trolling, um, kind of manipulating what, what people see online, uh, amplifying certain issues, manipulating certain, certain, uh, certain stories, uh, taking already existing divisive issues, further dividing the United States and actually taking it, it brings out the worst in people, the worst in human nature, and it's actually led to events in the United States where things that happen online, um, kind of the, the, the nastiness and, and volatility that you see online will actually play out in the, in the real world. So, um, what to do about this as we deal with this on both sides of the Atlantic, because it's not the United States. They, they tried the same thing in France. Um, and we're seeing the rise of far-right parties all over Europe. Uh, we saw, for example, Le Pen had once been considered a fringe party, but she gained some prominence in the election, did not win. But um, there was an attack on France, in Germany, uh, in the Netherlands. I mean, it is a trans, it's, it's a global phenomenon. And, um, and you can see in the US, if you follow the news, which is really dr uh, draining. <laughs> um, I mean, it is every day, it's, it's it, America actually right now is more divided now than since the Civil War, um, according to some scholars, which is a little bit of a troubling tidbit of a fact. But people always ask, well, what do we do about this? So I always say awareness. Um, as I had mentioned, um, before the 2016 election, people thought this was not really a big deal. Uh, over in Europe, I think in the Baltics, uh, which I commend, commend the Baltic nations, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, you have been on the forefront sounding the alarm bell saying disinformation, hybrid threats, this is a real thing, this is something that uh, democracies really need to be aware of. And uh, the US didn't really listen. <laughs> but I think a big part of it is spreading awareness so people understand, journalists, members of the public, members of the media, um, and, and students. I mean, uh, just the general public should be more aware of how to navigate this new media environment uh, where a lot of our, our lives and um, news consumption and the way that we're informed about the world is increasingly happening in the digital, digital realm, uh, social media and elsewhere. Um, to counteract what the, what the gentleman here said, I think media literacy is really important because we have this climate in the, in the US now, um, and it's not necessarily unique to the US, but where people are unable to differentiate the difference between truth and fact, fact and fiction, between sources that are legitimate and illegitimate sources. We also have an unprecedented attack on our 
uh, media in the US, being described as an enemy of the people. I have some friends that have been to rallies and have felt like their lives were threatened. I mean, this is, this is not, that unfortunately is not fake news. So, um, and there have been studies uh, where uh, in some environments where media literacy programs have been implemented and there has been shown to be some positive results in understanding, understanding the role that the media plays as a fourth estate, um, where you are not as hostile toward, toward the media and the job that they do, and um, being more critical thinkers and critical consumers of, of the media. And lastly, accountability. I think uh, this is something that we're getting to, accountability for the social media platforms that have allowed for disinformation to spread, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, and the YouTubes, uh, and platforms that um, we now know knew about the problem as it was happening, but didn't do anything about it because they didn't want to hurt their business model. Um, so there's new scrutiny around that. And uh, we do have a new Congress coming up that's going to be doing more investigating on that. So accountability, not only for the tech platforms that allow for this to happen, uh, but accountability for really all of us in how we how we consume the news, what we share, and um, how we can be more resilient, how societies can be more resilient to bad actors and hostile foreign governments manipulating um, our democracies, our elections, and our internal politics. Looking ahead, we, uh, we, we, well, we just had an election, midterm elections in the United States, and some analysts are saying that that was kind of a testing ground for 2020. Midterm elections are kind of complicated. There's hundreds of elections going on. It's hard to figure out you know, how, to, how, to, how to manipulate it, who to target. There was still some activity that was detected. Um, so there, there's some talk that 2020 or 2018 is kind of a, a testing ground for 2020. We have parliamentary, um, the uh, elections in parliament coming up. Uh, so things to look out for looking forward. Um, I feel like you guys know more about this issue a little bit better than we do in, in the US. At least we're, we're getting there. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. I wish I had a more uh, positive focus, but it's great to see great minds in tech coming together and um, hopefully together we can all find solutions. <laughs> so that's gonna conclude my, my presentation. I know that Juris wanted to do a uh, kind of like a fireside chat, is that correct? Um, unless there's any questions, I think I saw a gentleman with his hand up. We have been thinking uh, with uh, our friends in, uh, in our publishing company, what has motivated actually such uh, a big number of uh, Russian former journalists? By the way, Mr. Salavyov, the big propagandist, has also been a quite normal journalist previously. What has motivated them almost as a whole, to turn themselves into propaganda weapons. Is it threat? Is it money? Is it patriotism? What's your pick of it? I, uh, I think it's a combination of all those things. It's really interesting. Uh, I used to draw a distinction between RT and Fox News, uh, but I no longer draw that distinction anymore. I mean, Fox News has become an all-out state media from, from my, I try not to watch it, it makes me a little bit upset, but um, it really has become a mouthpiece for, uh, for the Trump administration. And um, so there's, there's that. Um, there is, I think, a growing wave of, of nationalism in the US and people think that uh, the, the, the message resonates with people, and I think that that's an important thing to understand about disinformation. Not only, you know, whether it comes from Russia or China or Iran, we saw some evidence that Iran had tried to uh, interfere in our last election. Uh, but there is a strong, and you see it not only in the United States, but on both sides of the Atlantic, the messages tend to be very similar. It's anti-globalization, anti-elite, um, anti-establishment, 
Uh, all these things are so strong in sentiment right now that people are actually willing to turn to uh, Russian media or, or fake news sources because some people believe in the commander in chief when he says that the media is the enemy of the people and uh, anything critical of him is fake news. So they turn to other alternative media sources and, um, and, 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 and they believe what they see. Hi. Um, I have a question about the recent event, uh, comparatively recent, that happened in the US where a prominent reporter was banned from uh, the White House. Jim Acosta. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, well, that situation from across uh, of the ocean, it looked like a last straw kind of event that would, uh, I don't know, madden all the reporters and journalists. Has that uh, situation changed the overall situation in the US? Um, I think it has just been a continuation of the attacks on the press. Uh, I think that it was, it, it, it resonates actually with a base that actually hates the media and it played well with his base. Um, we do have a system of checks and balances in the United States. So CNN actually took that to the courts and uh, he was able to get his press pass back and get back to work. But um, but yeah, I mean, you see, it's just part of a continuing trend of, of the attack on, on the press. But uh, we have the courts and we have a Congress. We have a Congress with a new, uh, the new, the, the Democrats had, won the House. Um, I don't know how closely you follow U.S. elections, but there's expectation that there's going to be more oversight and more of a checks and balance system uh, within our within our political uh, political structures. But um, yeah, stuff like that's kind of embarrassing. To, <laughs> like, what is everyone? What are what are our friends in Europe thinking when they see that? <laughs> But yeah, honestly, I think it's just a continuation of attacks on, on the press. And sometimes I think you wonder if it's just for show, honestly. Do you know what, what will it take to, for the situation to stop? Or is there an ending oh, point? I think a lot of Americans are wondering that. Um, <laughs> we, um, there's been, uh, we have this investigation, a uh, special counsel that is looking into this very issue of the Trump campaign possibly coordinating or colluding with the Russian government. There's been some new revelations. Just in the last 48 hours, I came back from my flight here and checked the news. I'm like, oh man, I can't even get on a flight and I'm <laughs> missing the news. But um, but I think, um, I don't know, we'll see. Some people are asking about how sustainable this can be. Um, and there's, there's gonna be a lot more investigations. We have the Mueller case, I think, wrapping up. And then we're gonna have some more congressional investigations coming up. But um, Let's just hope that our uh, institutions are strong enough to endure the challenges that we're now facing. Okay, and now let's...